So let's think about, say this. So this is a common coordination compound notation. And we need to know, this is a lot more confusing than some of the, or complicated than some of the notations we had when we were working with the main elements. So we have to figure out what this means and what's going on here. Um, first of all, um, we should consider these, we should be modeling this as an ionic compound. Um, who's the anion? The yeah, these chlorines, not these. These chlorines we're treating as the anion. And then we're treating this whole complex as a cation. We're treating that whole complex in brackets as the cation. Uh, sometimes the complex in brackets is treated as the anion because the other thing is something that's a cation. But in this case, this has to be an anion because it's on the right hand side of the periodic table. Okay, um, so I, and of course we would have here that this would have negative two charge total, negative one each. So um, now let's go ahead and think about what's happening here with this cobalt. Well, th there's different ways to form, co so one way to think about this is that these species are covalently bonded to the, to the cobalt. So inside the brackets we have covalent bonds, and between these two things we have ionic bonds. But inside the brackets we have covalent bonds. Uh, well, there's two different ways to form covalent bonds, for example, How could you form the covalent bonds in water? Well, the way the covalent bonds in water are formed, here I've drawn all the valence electrons of uh, the free atoms. Well, they're formed by, say, this hydrogen could donate its electron, and this oxygen could donate its electron. And now those two electrons are forming this bond. And the oxygen could donate the electron here, and the hydrogen could donate an electron here. And that would form this bond. So the key point is that normally we form bonds by each atom donating an electron. But that's not how these covalent bonds are formed. In these covalent bonds, the transition metal isn't donating any electrons. Both electrons, so the, the pair of electrons is coming from these, which are called the ligands. The things that are covalently bonded, or the ligands. The things that are covalently bonded to the transition metal are the ligands. So we know that there's one chlorine in, um, in this complex. Right, so this is what's called the complex ion, because it's an ion and it's complex, whereas the chloride over here is a simple ion. So here we have a complex ion. Um, so a chlorine negative one would have eight valence electrons around it, and now we can imagine it taking an entire pair and donating it to this bond. Notice that if chlorine has a full octet, that must mean that it had a negative one charge to start with. On the other hand, ammonia can have a full octet just as a neutral molecule. Ammonia is just a separate neutral molecule, so it doesn't have to start with a charge. But we know that neutral nitrogens have one lone pair. So the neutral nitrogen can take its one lone pair and use that to form the bond. So we imagine these covalent bonds being formed by, one, uh, by the ligands donating the, their lone pair rather than sharing the electrons. I'm not trying to get the geometry right here, I'm just showing the bonding. Okay. Okay, so that's one way to imagine this complex ion. These are called then Lewis bases. A Lewis base is, an op is a species that donates an electron pair. And that would mean the cobalt is a Lewis acid, which is a species that receives an electron pair. So this is a new way to form covalent bonds that's different from what we saw before. Before we saw elements that were um, both donating one electron each. And here we have the elements that are one, the ligands are, are the only ones donating the electrons. Now the cobalt could still have some electrons, uh, but those will just be in lone pairs. Um, so any of, the remaining, the, any of the electrons the cobalt has or started with will be in its lone pairs, but we're not thinking of those as contributing to the covalent bonds. 
All right, now this is a little confusing because even though we oftentimes think of these as covalent bonds, in other models we think of these as ionic bonds as well. For example, in the crystal field model that we'll get to soon, we actually think of these as ionic bonds, not covalent bonds. Well, as we've talked about before, um, it just depending on the context, some models are helpful for one context and not for another context. These bonds are somewhat intermediate between covalent and ionic. Uh, why is it helpful to think of them as covalent? Well, what would happen if we dumped this in water? How, what would happen if this dissolved in water? Uh, let's see. In water, so the key point I wanted to make here is that in water, ionic compounds dissociate into separate pieces. So for example, in a solid, uh, the solid consists of a bunch of cations and anions interspersed around each other in a crystal uh, lattice. But if this was going to dissolve, the cations would separate from the anions. So the answer to my question is, what would happen if you put this in solution? The complex ions would separate from the anions. If they're dissolved, they wouldn't be close to each other anymore. They'd just be floating around separately. However, these things would not dissociate from the cobalt because these are covalent bonds. And generally, when you dissolve something, it's the ionic bonds that break and not the covalent bonds. For example, if you dissolve sodium chloride in water, it separates into Na plus and Cl minus, and they go their separate ways in the water. Whereas in solid salt, they would be connected to each other in a crystal lattice. So in the solid, the sodium and the chloride are kind of connected by ionic bonds, but the ionic bonds are dissolved by the water and they would be separate. But let's say that you dissolve sugar. Uh, I forget what the formula is for sugar. This, all right. Something like this is the formula for sugar. Um, if you dissolve this, so sugar does dissolve in water, right? You know that every time you put sugar in your coffee, say. But when you dissolve sugar in water, do the carbons and the hydrogens and the oxygens all split up? Well, no, they're still all connected in molecules because these are connected by covalent bonds. So normally covalent bonds are not broken when you dissolve something, only ionic bonds. All right, that's why it's important that we think of the bond between these two as ionic. So in solution, these will separate, but we think of these bonds as covalent. So in solution, these will stay together. So in the solid, these are connected in ionic bonds, but in solution, they would separate into these separate ions. How do I know there's a two plus charge here? To balance the two chlorides. But these, this is not going to separate in the solution. This will still be a single unit, if we, because we're thinking of these as covalent bonds. All right, so that's one reason why it's useful to think of those as covalent bonds. However, like I said, um, that's a useful model when you're thinking about dissolving things. On the other hand, when you're um, thinking about the crystal field theory, we're actually going to go back to thinking of these bonds as also ionic. So we use different models for different uh, situations. All right, that was worth talking about because I, I glanced at your homework and there were some questions about putting these into solution. So it's important to see what happens with these compounds when you put them into solution. Uh, okay, so, um, so that gives us the basic idea of um, these coordination compounds. A coordination bond is, again, when one species is donating its pair of electrons. 